Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention for one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the McDonald Laurier Institute's 10th anniversary dinner. What I forgot to tell you when I was speaking to you out in the lobby was that I talked to a lot of people 10 years ago about the idea of creating the Institute. The almost universal reaction was, nah, you don't want to do that. Waste of time, don't need it. And when I talk to those same people 10 years later, I don't remind them that I had that conversation with them, but they all say, 10 years, well, gee, haven't you always been there? How could we do without you? So, you know, it's very important to persevere in the face of the negativity of some Canadians. We have put together an exceptional program for you with speakers who have come from around the world to take part in this important discussion of Canada's role in the Indo-Pacific and the New World Order. And I can think of no one better to MC, MC this evening than Shuvaloy Majumdar. Shuv, as many of you know, is a Monk Senior Fellow with the Institute and he's leader of our Centre for Advancing Canada's Interests Abroad. A committed Democrat with immense physical courage, Shuv was based in Iraq and Afghanistan between 2006 and 2010, where he led the International Republican Institute's offices there. And if you put those dates together with my mention of his physical courage, you will understand what I mean. This overseas experience complemented his co-founding of an anti-human trafficking organization in Southeast Asia between 2000 and 2003, for which he was recognized with the Queen Elizabeth Golden Jubilee Medal. More recently, he served as policy director for successive Canadian foreign ministers. I'd like to ask you to welcome Shuv Majumdar to the platform who will guide you through the rest of this evening's program. Shuv. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Crowley, thank you for a far too generous introduction. I think we're starting a little bit late today. I know Dr. Crowley is a stickler for timing, uh, so I'll, st I'll kick this off by inviting Lindsay Alexandra White to inaugurate the evening with a rendition of the National Anthem. our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command, car ton bras s'est porté le il s'est porté la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée des plus brillants exploits. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for I don't know where Mark O'Neill is, so I'm going to invite him to come closer to the stage. Um, Mark O'Neill is a president and CEO of this Canadian War Museum and the Canadian Museum of History. Mark, we're grateful for the partnership you've had with MLI for many years now. As you can see, this is one of the most spectacular original venues that Ottawa has to offer. And so please come and uh, share with us some thoughts about the place. And thanks for having, letting us uh, be in your house for a bit. 
I'll, I'll be very brief. You have a long lineup of speakers, and I'll just say, Excellencies, Honorable Minister, or Senators, Members of Parliament, distinguished guests, welcome to the War Museum. And I should point out, by the way, that the 10th anniversary of MLI, and this year the 15th anniversary of the Canadian War Museum already. So just to mention that to you, thank you for being here this evening. Very quickly, je tiens aussi à remercier Brian de m'avoir si amiablement invité à prendre la parole à l'occasion de ce gala. And as always, this event is a wonderful occasion for the discussion of difficult and challenging subjects, which is what we think the War Museum is all about. And I, I will simply tell you uh, about uh, two particular exhibitions we'll be doing this year very quickly. In April, we will be welcoming a, a small traveling exhibition from the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. Uh, and in May, we'll proudly open Forever Changed, which is our new major exhibition marking the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Both exhibitions are a moving personal examination of a moment of vast significance for Canada and the world. And these stories illuminate the true nature and profound consequences of human conflict on a global scale. And they can inform our opinions about war and peace and help us examine our place in the international community. Finalement, je suis ravi que le Musée canadien de la guerre collabe avec l'Institut McDonald Laurier pour présenter cet important événement. J'ai bien hâte d'entendre les discussions de ce soir. Thank you. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Goodbye. Thanks. Okay. I guess we're getting ready to start the evening tonight. Um, soup is served, or will be shortly, so please feel free to start uh, dipping your spoons into your bowls this February evening here in our nation's capital. Um, permit me a few minutes to thank our sponsors and welcome some key dignitaries. Uh, first and foremost, our co-presenting sponsors, Canadian Natural and the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, thank you so much for your support for this evening. It wouldn't have happened without you. We're very grateful for your support. Our sponsors at LNG Canada. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Our sponsors at LNG Canada and National Bank, we're also grateful to, to you. Of course, our hosts here at the Canadian War Museum, our partner sponsors, including IPEX Canada and the Cement Association of Canada, media sponsors, including the Hill Times, iPolitics, and Epoch Times. Thank you all. Thank you so very much for making this evening possible. For strategic partners, uh, I also want to take a moment on behalf of the Institute to thank CPAC for broadcasting this important forum and dinner event, CIBC and Canada, Canadian Natural for co-sponsoring the uh, pre-dinner luncheon, and in just a few moments we'll hear more from the Canada India Foundation. We're also joined today by some significant members of the diplomatic community uh, from missions from all around the world that have their voices here in Ottawa. Uh, I'd like to invite the ambassadors, high commissioners, representatives, from the following countries to please stand. Japan, Korea, New Zealand, Taiwan, Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, Israel, Finland, Germany, Austria, Latvia, the European Union, and India. Thank you all so very much for being part of this forum. A special thank you, you may be seated. Uh, a special thank you to the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, Winston Wen Yi Chen, uh, Japan's Yasuhisu Kabamura, and India's Anshuman Gore for their helpful support for this evening tonight. I, now let me take a minute to acknowledge those who serve our country in the halls of our powers, uh, in the halls of parliament. Uh, I'd like to invite the following past and present parliamentarians to please stand, and with apologies for anybody I might miss, but I think we've got them all. Uh, James Bazan, Shadow Minister for National Defense, the Honorable David Pratt, former Minister of National Defense, the Honorable Judy Scrove, Pierre Paul, uh, Pierre Paul Hoos, Garnet Genuis, the Honorable Peter Kent, the Honorable Pierre Polyev, Shadow Minister for Finance, the Honorable Marjorie LeBreton, uh, the Honorable David Kilgore, Colin Carey, Jody Mittick, and Senator Colin Deacon. Ladies and gentlemen, our parliamentarians, thank you for your service. Let me take a few moments uh, to set the wider table as you commence your dinner for the conversation we're about to embark upon tonight. We are experiencing a world of strategic competition. In the aftermath of this century's first wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan, 
and in the aftermath of 2009's calamitous global economic recession. The century is now 20. In this world reorder, today we are witnessing three primary disruptions across all elements of geopolitical life. The first is the multipolar disruption posed by the resurgence of authoritarian and hegemonic states like China, Russia, Turkey, Iran, and other regimes that seek to upend the post-war international order and its institutions. Regimes that collectively pull the poles of power across the globe to fashion a reorder in their own image and who individually are revanchist, anti-liberal, and profoundly tyrannical. The second is a disruption posed by populism on both the left and on the right. It is a disruption that is characterized too often by condescension on one side and anger on the other. A disruption which confuses the delineation between national interest or nationalism and postmodern, post-national ideologies of revived collectivism. And the third disruption is a role that technology plays in every element of global security and prosperity, reshaping how we build things, how we learn, how we communicate, and how we live. It, is, it has manifest in technological opportunity to improve the quality of human life unlike in any era before, and alongside it, powerful questions of the protections around civil rights, the domain of large corporations, and of state-sponsored threats in cybersecurity. In the tests of these disruptions, Canada cannot afford a legacy of grave strategic errors that forsakes our national interests. It is an essential undertaking that my colleagues here at the McDonnell Laurier Institute have begun as we bring to life the Center for Advancing Canada's Interests Abroad. And so what are the interests of Canada in this era of global disorder? And what could be the basis of how to think of a Canadian foreign policy doctrine for the future? Well, security, prosperity, and values and in that order. Advancing the security of our people and the sovereignty of our borders against all threats, foreign and domestic, remains a primary responsibility of government. Advancing the prosperity of our people in explosive and new and emerging markets in the Indo-Pacific, while old and established ones like Europe begin to wane. Advancing strategic cooperation among democracies in a world where the institutions originally designed to safeguard our values are under assault by emboldened authoritarians. In advancing this thesis, let me thank the Center's Deputy Director, my partner in this, in this ambitious venture, Jonathan Berkshire Miller, for his immense contributions and leadership in this cause. Together we have, <laughs> together we have enlisted some of the finest minds in Canada who have animated our newspapers, network television broadcasts, radio and, po radio and podcasts across this country with lively debate. Our ranks are now joined by national security thought leadership with gentlemen like ex-national security advisor Dick Fadden, ex CSIS director Ward Alcock, who's here tonight, global prosperity thought leadership with renowned economist Jack Mintz, the best national scholars and experts like Kaveh Sharuz, Charles Burton, Marcus Kolga, Christian Lupret, Duanji Chen, and more than I have time to acknowledge tonight. Across the gambit of Canadian foreign policy, I'm so very proud of all our colleagues and their fierce thought leadership as part of Canada's strategic community. In the global strategic community, MLI is also establishing critical partnerships. Many things have happened between Canada and India in 2017. One of them included Prime Ministers Justin Trudeau and Narendra Modi, who announced the collaboration between the McDonnell Laurier Institute and India's Observer Research Foundation. We're also joining forces with Taiwan's Prospect Foundation, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, and the Japan Institute for International Affairs. In 2020, we will embark upon partnerships with the Polish Institute for International Affairs, Israel's Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies, the United Arab Emirates Bahuth Center for Dialogue, and many others, generating the critical ideas essential to, Can to Canadian interests as we engage the coming age. Just as the end of the Cold War was the defining geopolitical reality of the 1990s and early 2000s, so too will the shift of the planet's economic center of gravity from the Atlantic to the Pacific define this decade and well beyond. It brings to the theme of this very evening the, of the Indo-Pacific region and this crucible 
of the New World Order. It is a theme that Canada's foreign affairs officials are contemplating today deeply as they conduct a review of our position in the region uh, and prepare their recommendations to the government later this year. Many of those colleagues who serve our country abroad are here today. Welcome and thank you for being a part of this very important event. The transatlantic architecture of the past half century could serve as a roadmap for what a trans-Pacific one would look like today. In advancing our security, our prosperity, and our values, Canadians have a proud legacy in shaping the last 70 years of economic and geopolitical life. In security, Canada has played an essential role in building the multilateral global security architecture by fashioning the largest military alliance in the world through NATO. Formed through informal conversations in the corridors of the wider transatlantic alliance in response to the oil shocks and economic crisis of the 70s, the G7 initially conceived its mandate as the economic steward of the world's major free market democracies, just as NATO sought to safeguard their security. And the United Nations, for all its imperfections, provided a forum for the good, the bad, and the ugly, where dialogue could have the opportunity to abate wars, and where all members have signed their aspiration to its founding charter, a charter that codifies the values for a world ordered upon the rule of law, centered upon the inalienable rights and dignity of every person. In the last 70 years, through decolonization and cold wars, through proxy wars and state-backed terrorism, through recessions and famines and massive global and urban migration, this transatlantic economy has undeniably underpinned the greatest period of human progress in history, resulting today, right now, in the rise of the Indo-Pacific and all it portends for Canada and for a needed update to global diplomacy and alliance building. It would be tempting, don't you think, to just copy and paste this architecture for the changing Indo-Pacific? So much of our national academic life, our senior civil service, our national commentary is based on this transatlantic tradition, at times at the expense of our status as a Pacific nation. For Canada to be successful, we ignore the Indo-Pacific region at our peril, and we must think differently about our ambition in it. Behind the curtain, of every conversation in this region is the profoundly important strategic challenge posed by the rise of China against the norms of democratic free market prosperity that the transatlantic community first arose to defend. For all of China's much vaunted economic progress following the Deng Xiaoping reforms of the 1980s, much of its economy remains closed, state-driven, and statistically opaque a trend explicitly intended to continue under the regressive autocracy of President Xi Jinping, MLI's designee for Policymaker of the Year in 2019. A third of all economic growth now occurs in the Pacific region, where more than half of humanity dwells, inspiring the International Monetary Fund to declare it the most important engine for global growth. This growth will see many Vancouver's and Toronto's emerge across the Indo-Pacific in the coming decades. And those cities will need arterial ports, roads, air corridors, and critical infrastructure. This industrialization, the principal source for global pollution, ought to be fueled by Canada's natural gas, our petroleum, our nuclear and renewable technologies, displacing both unstable regimes and older higher emissions technologies. The alliance building among the Indo-Pacific's democracies demand not only our attention, but our active participation. As the world continues to experience these transformative changes, I would argue that, the shaping, that, that our history of shaping the transatlantic order uh, of the post-war era has indeed prepared us well for the Indo-Pacific era before us. Because we are both an Atlantic and a Pacific nation, because we are the inheritance of the political heritage of an old era and a diverse home of peoples who hail from the new era. The time is now for the conversation in our national capital to be as much about the Indo-Pacific as it has been about the transatlantic, accompanied with the big ideas and essential solutions for how Canadians can shape the events that future generations will inherit. So that on the Macdonald laurier Institute's 50th annual forum, we can look back at these times and be grateful for the conversations that were commenced here and today. So thank you all for taking the time tonight for being a part of this. Uh, and thank you to all who are about to hear from as you help guide our deliberations tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Let me turn now to um, introduce some important initiatives we're launching at MLI today. Uh, a few years ago, Vijay Sapani joined the MLI board as we began the hard work of establishing a presence across a foreign policy issues important to Canada. He helped establish MLI's relationship with, the, in, with India's Observer Research Foundation, has been a tremendous friend and voice, is a tremendous bridge to communities across Canada. I'm so very pleased that he has established the Ila Sapani Fellows Program at MLI, dedicated towards strengthening the Canada-India strategic dialogue. Vijay, thank you, my friend. Where are you? Please take a stand. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Anil Shah to approach the podium. Um, the Canada India Foundation has been a remarkable institution for Indo-Canadians as they seek to elevate the idea of India in Canada. Uh, Anil, come on stage. Uh, the, please welcome the chairman of the Canada India Foundation, Mr. Anil Shah, for an important adventure we're announcing today. Thank you. <clears throat> My God, this guy can talk, hasn't he? You know, and I had a chance and an opportunity to meet with him in Mumbai a couple of weeks ago. But he also told me that he's holding the trigger of that tank. So what happened in Mumbai remains in Mumbai. Is that okay? okay. Friends, dignitaries, every one of you. Welcome to this beautiful 10th gala dinner of MLI. And we at CIF are very humble and proud to be associated with them. Shuale, you're the man. Brian, you spoke from your heart out there 10 years ago what started and what it is today. And I hope 50 years later, we're going to see something better. Amazing. Thank you. Let's give a big hand to MLI. <clears throat> Friends, on behalf of the Board of Governors of Canada India Foundation, it gives me immense pleasure to announce the launch of CIF MLI Fellowship Program. This new initiative will give a new impetus to the collective effort of both the organizations for India-centric public policy research. The two programs that will be launched under this initiative are Thought Leaderships, Canada-India Strategic Dialogue, Foreign Policy and National Security Roundtable Briefings Series. We are confident the CIF MLI collaboration will yield positive results in generating more intense collaborations on all aspects of bilateral relations. Allow me to introduce to you what Canada India Foundation is. Canada India Foundation was formed in 2007 by like minded Canadians of Indian origin who were leaders of industry and commerce. Jointly, we employ over 5,000 people, Canadians, in this country. We understood the future of both Canada and India is in col closer collaboration. The Foundation's focus is to make the Canadian establishments realize the immense potential of collaboration between Canada and India on all aspects of bilateral relations. The two main objectives of our foundations are to foster bilateral relations and to create opportunities for qualified Indo-Canadians in the Canadian mainstream. To achieve this, we have adopted a 360 degree approach. We emphasize the criticality of India and of the Indo-Canadians to the Canadian future. Economically, India offers Canada a large and maturing market that will reach its full potential in this decade. Let me state a simple fact. The upward trajectory in the Canada-India relations that we have seen in the last decade coincides with Canada-India Foundation's 
rise in the Canadian public policy landscape. We have worked with our partners in the government at all levels to advance Canada's interest in India. Let me cite a few examples. <clears throat> in the last decade, CIF advocated for a renewed engagement with Gujarat, one of the most prosperous and industrialized regions of India. We engage government decision makers to take a fresh look at the bilateral opportunities that Gujarat offered and not be misinformed by unfounded allegations and spurious media reporting. The result, Canada was among the first countries to positively engage with Gujarat and is today reaping benefits by engaging with Gujarat state political and business leaders. By working the civil nuclear cooperation file and showcasing India as a responsible user of nuclear technology and materials for civilian purposes, that it demonstrably is. <laughs> the result, the promulgation of Canada-India nuclear cooperation agreement after decades of isolation of India in this peer. By fostering support for elected officials who make the time and commitment to hear the aspirations of Indo-Canadians, these aspirations are no different from the aspirations of any well-being Canadians to live in a free and democratic society, to pursue meaningful economic pursuits for the betterment of our families, and to ensure the security and well-being of our country. I'm confident that by collaborating with MLI, which is renowned for its rigorous and nonpartisan research on public policy, our foundation will embark upon a new era of productive and proactive policy formulations that will benefit both Canada and India. With that, I'd like to say thank you once again. Thank you, Shul. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, MLI. Wonderful evening. Have a great evening. Okay, thank you, Anil. I'm looking forward to working with you, uh, your colleagues, Satish Takar and Pankaj Dave, uh, and all the others in realizing this ambitious project. It'll be a lot of fun, uh, and we'll have a, a great deal of proactive, productive work to do together.